uh, Evening with Hewling's Salon series. Um, I'm really excited about the whole series and about this evening. And uh, I want to thank Shirley Holland for making this possible and and playing with us. Um, for hosts, it's it's so far it's been great. It's getting better and better. So thank you very much, Shirley. And there she is. She can't see us, but we can see her, and you look great. You're um, looking good, Shirley. <laughs> <laughs> So tonight we have a uh, acclaimed painter, Dean Mitchell, watercolorist, um, who I know our, our host, Alex McAdams, will give a, a full intro in a moment to Dean. But I just want to thank you, Dean, for, for being an advisor to CHF and offering us your expertise and ideas and for being uh, an inspiration um, as an artist and as a, as a terrific human and um, for agreeing to do this. I think this is going to be a great conversation. Um, yeah. And uh, so Alex McAdams, thank you for joining us and, and, and uh, kind of leading this conversation. Alex is a member of the CHF team. She's our development coordinator. Um, she's worked on fundraising, creating content for nonprofits, tech companies, museums like the, like MoMA, uh, Carnegie Corporation, Berkeley Institute for Free Speech, um, Helen Frankenthaler Foundation, and the Brooklyn Museum. Um, Alex also has a background in law and social justice, and she herself is a painter. And we have also availed ourselves of her tremendous um, digital and uh, video storytelling expertise. If you, if you watch some of our videos, that is often Alex helping us with that. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to you guys because no one's here to listen to me. Um, and it, it, as we go through, if you have questions or comments that come up, please go ahead and type them into chat and, and we'll try to bring those in during the course of the conversation or maybe the end. We'll see how it goes. And uh, without further ado, I turn it over to Alex and Dean. Hey, hey everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm really excited and thrilled to introduce introduce renowned painter and artist, Dean L. Mitchell. I'm gonna give you a little intro and then we'll get into some conversation. Well known for his figurative works, landscapes and still lifes, Dean L. Mitchell was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and grew up in Quincy, Florida. He's a graduate of Columbus College of Art and Design in Columbus, Ohio. In addition to watercolor, he's accomplished in other mediums, including egg tempera, oil and pastel. Dean has received over 600 awards for his work, including three gold medals from the American Watercolor Society and both the Donald Teague Award and the Robert Lougheed Memorial Award at Pre de West. Incidentally, Clark Hewlings won the inaugural first prize award at the Pre de West in 1973. Other notable things I think are notable to mention about Dean's work and career are that he was one of the four painters um, that were selected to be interviewed by former President Barack Obama to paint his presidential portrait and was nominated by two different people or institutions. One of the known was the National Portrait Gallery. His work is also in Maya Angelou's personal collection and he created original etchings for one of her books. And he also designed the iconic Louis Armstrong postage stamp. Dean sits on the CHF advisory board, as Elizabeth said, and we're, we're thrilled to have him here this evening. So welcome, Dean. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Nice to be here. Um, for the conversation. Yeah, and I'd love to just start it out by you sort of taking the lead and talking, get, telling us a little bit about yourself, about your process or your art or how you got into art. I think you have a really interesting story and career trajectory. So whatever you feel comfortable or want to share, I think that would be a good starting place. Okay, well, I grew up in a small rural town in North Florida. Uh, I was raised by my grandmother from 11 months old. Uh, my mother was the first to go to college uh, out of her four children. 
and my grandmother got me a paint by number set, which is how I really got interested in the creative process. My mother was not thrilled about my going into art as a career. She felt that it was just too difficult for a person of color to make a living selling pictures and that this was not a good choice. Uh, but I had a, a lot of, uh, I have friends who are also interested in art. We often would go outside and, and draw uh, from nature and we're using actually pens, uh, a lot of pencils, not a lot of paint. We didn't have a lot of paint at, early on, but, uh, and I had a junior high school teacher uh, who was very influential and in, uh, introducing me to competitions and jury art shows when I was young. A lot of times we were the only black people there. This was a white gentleman taking us around to these different shows. Uh, and uh, he told me that I, I saw things abstractly, which uh, at the time I didn't, had no idea what that meant. But I told him, Mr. Harris, that's great, but I wanna make something look like something. You know, and so he explained to me uh, how difficult it was to, to, show, to teach someone to see abstractly, but I suffered with technique, but I had an interesting eye for the way I saw things. So, and I attended a Columbus College of Art and Design. I graduated from there, got a job at Hallmark Cards as an illustrator. For a few years, I was let go. And I will tell you, I discovered that I did not have the temperament for illustration. I didn't like it. Um, I wanted total freedom to express myself as painter and illustration was too encompassing for me as a painter, uh, as an artist, uh, though, you know, illustrators are artists, uh, but uh, I found that I just, I needed that freedom, um, you know, so that's kind of where I'm at now. And uh, so I, I, I enjoy painting. I enjoy the unpredictability of it. Uh, particularly watercolor. Um, and I am an artist who I don't really have a formula. Although I went to school, I studied different theories of color and had great uh, anatomy drawing classes. I had design classes and, and but I took a lot of painting classes and, and things like that. But uh, it has informed my work quite a bit. But what really informs my work is really how I was raised. I grew up in poverty. I am very drawn to isolated things. I am very drawn to things that are discarded and felt used and abandoned uh, because I myself as a child growing up felt abandoned by my own father uh, whom I knew uh, and whom I since met. And I love my father. He loves his grandchildren. I have a great relationship with him. Uh, and, uh, but uh, it's really for me as a painter, um, I love exploring the, the common man. Uh, I like things that have a sense of struggle about them, a sense of survival about them. I, I tend to be drawn to, to things like that. Uh, they're not necessarily pretty, but to me, they have a real heart-wrenching gut to them that speaks to my sensibility as a human being. That's what I'm interested in as a painter. I'm not interested, I mean, I, I, like any artist, I want to sell my work, but I do not paint for an audience. Uh, that's what I found not fitting to me uh, as a painter, as an illustrator. I just did, I, you know, you had to please a client or something, uh, colors, move, you know. So I just found that I, I, I found it more rewarding to me emotionally and personally to pursue my own and my own freedom as a painter. Um, and I hope that makes sense to anyone. Uh, but, um, and I have had a number of experience with galleries uh, trying to tell you what to paint, what will sell better than one thing or the other. Uh, and <laughs> I'm going to paint what I want. That's, you know, if it sells and people like it, great. But if it doesn't, uh, I've had works that have sat in my studio for 10 years and I've sold them much later to collectors. Uh, a lot of times uh, as an artist, um, we want to be accepted, but at the same time, um, in order to have people to look at something differently, you have to take a risk. And that's what I love about being a fine artist, is that it allows me that freedom of risk taking. Um, and so that's what I love about it. Do you feel like, I'm curious, I, I think I could go a million different directions with different things that you've said here. And there's a lot of, po of points that I would love to come back to, but, just to follow up immediately on what you just said, thinking about your work and looking at sort of the history or the transgression of it, do you feel like you might be, 
at a point where you're able to take more risks or did, did you do that from you know the start where you felt sort of like you were maybe disenfranchised by the art world so what does it matter or do you feel like you played it safe and sort of worked your way up to be able to be in a position to to be more risky I've always taken risks. I think it had a lot to do with the fact that I was told I'd never make any money anyway. Um, and race was always a part of that equation. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I ended up with a gallery uh, in Panama City when I was probably like 18 or 19 years old, had my first gallery show there. And Zotan Bush uh, was a Hungarian immigrant who had just opened up a small gallery up in Panama City, Florida. And he told me, to paint what I love, uh, paint what I want, you know, and I have I have stayed true to that. Uh, now, certainly, like I said, uh, you want to sell, but I've always just, you know, for me as a painter, uh, like I've painted a lot of tobacco barns and different things like that. It's because I grew up in the South. I worked in tobacco. I know that space. I know that space intimately. I know I had a lot of friends who worked in it. I know the troubling history of tobacco in terms of, of cancer, because my uncle Sam died of cancer uh, from smoking cigarettes. So I have a long history with that space and, that, and those structures. And so uh, I did so many of them when I was a kid, I thought I'd never do them again. And when I returned to Tampa, I started going back, uh, which is about a four hour drive north of here. And I found myself looking at the structures again with a different kind of sensibility uh, and began to probe it again, which I thought I'd never do uh, because we know the barn is a subject that has been romanticized uh, throughout American history. But I think that the way I approach it uh, with the, the abstract quality of it, the, the, the viciousness in which I drop the paint within the atmosphere of the structure that sits in the space creates a kind of violent language that speaks to me as a painter and as the space in which I occupied as a child. So that transformed into a more of a spiritual connection with the space. Uh, it's not just a rendering of a form, but it's an emotional reaction to that space. Yeah, I'm curious about um, the, the connection you just made to abstract art. This is a, a thing that's talked about often about the connect the connectedness or not, or you know, whether it's disjointed, the connection between realism and abstract art. Um, I, I think there's, you know, we talked about we were hoping today to have Kelly Baum, one of the curators of the Alice Neal exhibit at the Met, join us. We were in contact with her due to scheduling. She couldn't be here. We're hoping to, to do something else with her. But, you know, it, it, just to talk about the conversation of how abstraction is part of realism, because I think that maybe there's some misunderstanding that there's not, that those elements do not exist in realism when in fact, you know, like Clark Hewlings, for example, he has composite paintings. So you talk about you're bringing in different elements, you're creating a scene that in itself lends itself to abstraction. So I, I'm curious about your, you know, where do you see yourself, I guess, the bigger question, where do you see yourself fitting in within realism and how does abstraction also play into that? Because your paintings to me, a lot of them are much more clearly, um, and maybe we could pull in a couple of paintings now, Penelope, I, I don't, you know, like thinking about even talking about Clark and you, there's two paintings that I thought were interesting to pair against each other. One is the immigrant is your painting that to me has very clear abstract qualities. It's funny because you painted this in oil and you mostly do watercolor and the one I'm going to do show for Clark is actually done in watercolor and his primary <laughs> medium is oils. So that's a funny, but the um, Mending Nets is, is Clark Hewling's painting. And it's, you know, we could talk about different elements about this, about point of view, perspective, the worker, there's a lot of directions we could go. But I think in just while we're here, talking about the abstract elements, um, you know, with, you know, depth of field, not necessarily negative space, like Alice Neal talks about, but there are much stronger elements than some of your other pieces that I think are very abstract. And the same with the, the Clark Hewlings piece. So I'm just curious about how you see yourself fitting within these, these two mediums. Well, if you look at the figure, it is quite, it is quite abstract. There, there, there is a kind of minimalism 
uh, with the choices of color, shape. And there is uh, a lot of interest with the interlocking forms of the broom handle and the locking forms between the two arms, the negative space that flows around the head. And if you look at the variety of shapes uh, and even with the way the space drops back, pulls forward based on value and subtle tones. And if you look at the face, you, you see very little detail. So it is a very abstract work. Uh, do you recognize it? Yes. The relationships of values and, and forms, you form the real, but it's a, it's a very abstract work. But it also, uh, for me, I thought about the immigrant and the types of jobs and different things that they do, which are usually very labor intensive. And so here again, trying to also portray a sense of humanity and the struggle in which people migrate to a, a different country to try to find a sensibility in that space and to try to survive in it. So it has a lot of, uh, and then the temperature, the temperature changes uh, depending on how the light's hitting it. So, but there's a lot of interesting negative space around the figure and it's a very simplistic work. Uh, and, you know, whenever you're doing something very, very simple, uh, you really have to be conscientious of how you compose and how you set the figure in the space to make the, the shapes interesting around it, because it's hard to hold someone's interest with something so simple. Uh, but I, I think it does it pretty well in terms of the way I, I've handled it. Oops, sorry, I was on mute. Yeah, yeah. I was actually thinking about another. Um, there's a, a, an excerpt from the forthcoming book uh, coming out about Clark Hewlings. There's a piece, there's an excerpt piece by, and I don't know if um, Jim Balistrieri is here right now and wants to talk about this, but he did a, an excerpt piece called Of Canvas and Tarp. And I did just from something that you said about composition, I think that's the biggest, or one of the big tie-ins between realism and abstraction that might sort of connect the two, uh, thinking about composition. And you started this by saying that one of your teachers when you were young said that you, your composition is very abstract and you think abstractly. So I think there's one, there's one painting of Clark Hewlings in that article that talks about this a bit more that I thought was really interesting. And I'd, I'd love to hear what you have to, to say about this, but it's called the melon stand. And he uses, it's, it's the, the excerpt is about using tarps and ropes to sort of create space and contain different images and it's very intentional. So he talks about how these this web of ropes sort of lock off a woman walking by and your eye is kind of directed there and about linear perspective and things. And Jim, you feel free to jump in if you want to. Um, but I'm just curious, do you, in terms of composition, how do you approach a piece? I'd be really interested to hear about that. Do you think about these things intentionally? Um, or does it sort of come as your, do you do composite pieces or do you do, a, how do you work? What's that process? I, I you know what, I, I don't do a lot. I do a lot of drawings. I tend to work a lot from drawings, uh, but a lot of it's pretty intuitive. I don't have, a lot of times when I start something, you don't always have a, an, an exact idea how it's gonna wind up because I wasn't really, though I, took classes, I wasn't, I wasn't really taught um, how to mix color and this and that. I, I, in, in painting class, they didn't really show us, they didn't demonstrate in that way. Uh, I had classes in theories of color and how to, uh, I, we talked about high key, chroma level, uh, value scale, different things like that. But as far as the actual paint, painting class, the, the instructor never really did anything. And so I, I, know, I know for a fact that I have really bad habits in, in painting um, because uh, I, I don't have a system. <laughs> I'll be honest, I've given workshops and I, sometimes I confuse people. Uh, it's very intuitive. It's not, um, and I think that's probably why some of the, the work you, you'll see a, a, a kind of risk in it because uh, although I have knowledge of painting from just doing it over and over, there is a degree of risk and, and unpredictability. Uh, and so it evolves as I'm doing it. Uh, sometimes I'll have something in that does not work for me and I 
painted out uh, in, in watercolor, it's unforgivable. So there is no painting out. So it's very spontaneous and direct. I, and I like it for that very reason. Now I've had watercolors that I'm now using. I, I use acrylics a lot. I've converted watercolors into acrylics because sometimes I see some of the watercolors and sometimes there's, I, there's too much busyness in it and, I, and I'll start abstracting the form either with color temperature or laying a color over top of it and still having some of the watercolors slightly come through. So you have this kind of fluctuation of space within, within the surface, depending on what it is. Uh, and that shifts and changes as I'm working on the thing. Um, it's, it's, it's what color goes next to it may work really well and it doesn't, I paint it out and I, and I work something else in. There's no real formula. Sometimes I've mixed colors and can't even mix the damn color again. That's how, you know, my habits. Uh, but I think that for me as a painter, that's the emotional quality. The, the unpredictability of it is the, is the emotion that goes into the thing. Uh, is that it's not formulaic and it, it's, it will be hard sometimes to even reduplicate what I've done. And so I like that. I like that feeling of, of improvisation or, you know, I, I like that. It's kind of like a, like a, like a jazz, like a group of people, you know, getting together and jamming. And so when I go in my studio, because I have, I have, I probably have 20, 30 paintings one at one at once because I, you know, I, I can't stay focused on one thing. It, it, you know, I lose interest. And I have to go over here and work on something else. Um, I don't know if that makes any sense to anyone, but it's, my work is it's it's very intuitive. I've I've been to shows where I've seen the artist, um, you know, uh, particularly at Prita West and some of their shows where they they put their colors in a certain order and their temperatures and you know you look at my my palette it's like it's like stuff everywhere it's all over the place. I'm sorry, but it is uh, you know just so happens that sometimes it works out. It just works out. And if it doesn't, I just you know I start over <laughs> start over. That's how I paint. I don't have a, I don't have a system. Well, as a painter who's like still an amateur painter, I feel like that's very comforting because I'm sort of all over the place too in that way. <laughs> the, the the mixing the paint and having to get that color again it really resonates. Yeah, it's it, you, you've been there. So you know, but you know, talking about the the, the abstract thing, um, you know, I, I looked at a lot of. Um, Rembrandt's work and and I love Degas' work uh, and I see all the abstract expressionists and 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 Degas, Degas all you know it's, you see the abstract expressionists there you know uh, the negative space the the the, the abrupt uh, use of dragging the the paint across the surface and getting a certain effect uh, I was in uh, a museum in Atlanta the High Museum and I saw this this painting of of Degas and it was these dancers. And they were, they had one of the legs was thrusted on the bar and, and one of the arms kind of dropped to the side. And you could tell that the figure was totally inaccurate as far as size relationships and all this. But the way he handled the space and the way he composed it was so elegant and so beautiful that you, you got lost into the idea of seeing what was natural to the eye and you saw the abstraction with the way he arranged the forms and it was so lyrical and so beautiful and so magical that you didn't even give a crap whether it was accurate because he had composed it in such an abstract way that it just it was just magnificent it was just unbelievable it just stole my heart it was beautiful painting unbelievable and i and i like i like work like that I, I, I really like work like that. Yeah. I'm wondering if that just is a side note, because I remember hearing in um, an interview that I either read or listened to that you did, that you talked about how you refused to do commissions. And I, I sort of love that personally, because you're doing it again, it's for yourself. And I think this ties into in, in sort of a bit of a segue to the, the next topic that I definitely want to hit. But I do love that. I love that you said in the interview, I think that someone said to you, will you do a commission? You said, no, I don't do commission commissions. And they said, what if it's for Oprah? And you said, nope, I don't do commissions. Yeah, that, that did like, happen. In that moment, hearing that, I was like, how amazing is he? That was, that was Stephen Graham. That's Stephen, yeah. Stephen yeah. It's pretty yeah. amazing. But um, I loved that. 
But I do think thinking about that, you said this in the context within that interview that really stuck with me. You said, what are you going to do when you have your moment in the sun? What is it about? Like, what is the purpose of this? What's the bigger purpose? Is the moment in the sun going to be about you or is it going to be something larger? And I think, you know, the, it, we probably could talk about this for a million hours and you and I have had some private conversations where we've gotten into the nitty gritty about politics and identity and but just speaking sort of in a, on a larger scale, because we don't have a ton of time, I am curious to think about how you think of yourself in terms of, you know, political art or protest art. So, I, you know, I follow you and I, I look at all your work and I, do, I, I bought a print of yours that was the vote painting. At that time, it felt very politically charged and it also felt very different for a variety of reasons. There was very bold graphic text. Yeah. Um, but also it, it was making some sort of a statement. And I just love to hear from you about how you sort of see yourself fitting into that or whether there's been sort of a transgression of your, your political overt. And I will say, I think a lot of your stuff is political. I mean, it's storytelling. You're painting images of people in real life and you're obviously telling a story, as you said, about their struggles and their, you know, their experience, which in itself is implicitly political. Um, but I'd love to hear you talk about that a little bit. Well, you know, I, I think a lot of that, again, uh, I grew up uh, doing the civil rights movement. Uh, I watched the assassination of, of Dr. King, but, I, and, uh, you know, so, and President Kennedy and, 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 you know, different political leaders. So that has always resonated with me. Um, you know, the human condition and, and, the things that we do to one another is, is just really sometimes really heart wrenching. Uh, and so as a painter, though I am African American, and I'm proud that I'm a person of color. Uh, I'm going to jump across and do what I want. Uh, for example, like the barns, it, when people hear my take on the barn, uh, suddenly some people become uncomfortable because they built enormous amounts of wealth from this. And, and at the same time, I see the link between those structures and slavery. It is very obvious. Uh, and so I know at some point when America is ready to grapple with that, those barns will, will be looked upon totally different than a romantic image. Uh, and so in that lies a, another kind of conversation about humanity, which is what my work has always been about for me. Uh, you know, life is fleeting. I watched my grandma Celie die when I was very young. So what I don't want to do with my life is waste my life painting something that is just, that does not resonate on a deep uh, humanitarian level. And so when I look at, um, for example, I can use this when, when I first got invited to be a part of, you know, the Western shows out West. Um, I got a call from John Garrity about this. And I said, well, I'm really a Western artist, Mr. Garrity. And, uh, you know, but he wanted me in the show. And I, you know, he wanted to show some of my African-American figurative works. And uh, I said, Mr. Garrity, your audience is not interested in this. He said, oh, no, you know, uh, I was down there at the Hubbard show when Rowena was, Rowena was shown. It was just a show I was invited to down at the Hubbard Museum. The Hubbard Museum was about and so I sent in these African-American figures and people walked right by them you know just like they did not want that it was not they they were not feeling that you know and so I I began to uh to learn a little bit more about the west and its history of the Buffalo Soldiers and just so happened I met a group of Buffalo Soldiers in Fort Leavenworth Kansas they had told their story it was heart-wrenching and so I began to do some things of them and what I came across realizing was I did them, I, start, I decided uh, to do them very small uh, for their miniature show. And I noticed I sold them. And I thought, is this because of the history? Is this because they're small and they don't occupy a lot of space in their home? Should they get them? So I began to probe the sensibility. So the next time I did something slightly bigger, uh, and so I began to sort of spoon feed the audience uh, in that way to get used to the idea of this, of this black image in the Western uh, genre, because I did not see very many at all at that time. And so uh, as, as things went along, 
I began to try to figure out how do I fit into this Western canon? And so I was invited to a show uh, at the Phoenix Art Museum called West Select by Jerry Smith. And a friend of mine said, have you ever been to a reservation? I said, no, I've never been to a Native American reservation. And a friend of mine uh, took me out there and I was just awestruck by the poverty, by the, it was just, it reminded me of, of the way I grew up in the South. And so naturally that space, you know, spoke to me in a very visceral way. And I said, this is what I shall paint. And I knew right away that people were not going to want to see that because it is linked to the history of what has happened to those people. But the space was so haunting, beautiful and haunting. And, and I knew people would not want them, but I realized that I was going to capture the modern day era. This was a part of the modern day conversation. I was not gonna let that moment bypass me. Now, throughout history, we have seen artists who have challenged the sensibility of their collectors, challenge the sensibility of their audience. I mean, when you think about Thomas Aiken's Gross Clinic, it was rejected by the National Academy. It was, you know, so, you know, you, there's a lot of artists, George Bellows, who went and wanted to do more urban things and more, you know, the visceral vilelessness in which he approached the paint uh, was very abstract and very haunting. But these are works that will live. These are works that, uh, that cannot be duplicated. And, and not only that, but to try to capture the space in which I live in and try to capture something that is going on for the moment. Uh, do I think that um, people are uncomfortable with those conversations? Absolutely. But it is the artist that makes us look at it deeper in a, deep, in a different way uh, to bring some connection to just to the history, to the, the struggles of what has happened to a people. Um, and that includes African-Americans uh, or any immigrants sometimes when they come and they, they, they wind up marginalized in these spaces. It is, it is the artist that bridges that humanity and make you look at, the artist reflects back to us what we become and how do we do better uh, and sometimes the artist cannot express it in a literal way. So they use abstract forms to, to show that, that haunting, uh, elusive abstract quality in the work. You feel it when you see it. When you see the work, you know it. It's, it's just there. Art is what it is. And so it's sometimes hard to describe it, but when you see it, it haunts you. It does not leave your mind. It's, it's, it's just part of the human soul that goes into the work that is unexplainable. Uh, it's not a formula. It's not looking for something picturesque. It's looking at what is going on in the world and connecting with it in a very human way. And that's what I've tried to do with my figures, whether they're African-Americans or not, is to show the full humanness of the, the people, the space that they occupy their struggles with humanity, all of that is pouring in, is hopefully pouring into that work. And sometimes that work is, does not have an appealing market. Uh, and sometimes I find collectors who love it. They love the dialogue. They love the depth, the depth of it. Uh, and those are the kind of collectors I'm after. Um, so, uh, and so sometimes those works sit around for a while. It's because people are uncomfortable with seeing the, the troubling side of life, but it also makes you appreciate the beauty of the struggle, the beauty of survival. It's- and The dignity of the people. I think that's a big, I think what's interesting that I've read in, you know, reviews about your work and listen to different things is there are very different comments that are contradictory and it's interesting to see who, who is making them. So you, I know some of your work has been called too romantic, too personal. It's, yeah. it's been said to, that your, your work is not nostalgic or sentimental. I mean, those to me are, are comments about your work that are conflicting a bit. And I just think it's interesting to look to the source and 
and, and think about, you know, what's their experience? What are they bringing to this that they're making this comment about your work? Um, I think that's, you know, everything is subjective too. You're, you're sort of, you're, you're giving it an image, a painting, you're telling a story. I love your, I don't have images of it, but I love your reservation pieces, by the way. Um, I think that series is really incredibly powerful. That one painting that I don't, I forget the name of it, but it's gorgeous. It's on your website um, or in one of your galleries. But um, yeah, I think that it's just, it's interesting to look to the source about who's commenting about different things. Everyone can have a different relationship with your work. Absolutely, absolutely. Because people bring uh, their own experiences. Uh, for example, you know, some uh, people may say something about my, my paintings of tobacco barns and the ruleness of, of, of that space. But a lot of times, sometimes the people who are making these assessments have not even been in a barn have not even worked in a barn. So their, their view of looking at this is a very superficial one. And perhaps based upon movies they've seen or something they've read that was very romantic. Uh, but like, again, I think that some of my work, uh, you know, because of the way I handle light, uh, they may associate that with a kind of romance uh, in some way, you know, but I think that there is, uh, uh, there's something uh, in those spaces that when people see them, I think that there, there's emotion to it. And I think that's what they wrestle with. I think there's a, and I like the fact that some people do not like, like the work. I think that that is part of the, the struggle in looking at the spaces that we occupy and we all bring our own, our own baggage to something. So, you know, for example, uh, people may say my work of the Native American reservations are political. I do not see my paintings of the Native American reservations as political. What I see is a human struggle. What I see are people uh, in a space in which they, they don't quite know how to emerge out of. Some do, some do not. I grew up the same way. Some are able to get an education, some are not able to get an education. And so, in, but in, in those spaces, uh, you know, I have one called, uh, I think damaged spaces or something. There's all this, this, this spaces are run down. Some, sometimes people are still living in these trailers and different things. And so I'm really after not necessarily the, the romantic beauty of the West, I'm interested in the underbelly of what's going on in the in those majestic hills and the, that that I'm interested in the belly of the of the people living there and how are they living. Uh, that's my connection to those to those spaces. Uh, and I think people, when they look at my work, they say, "Unsentimental." Yeah, you know, it's not it's not sentimental, and it's not. It it's it's haunting, it's troubling, but the light, the way the light reveals the space and the, the damage in which nature has ravaged these spaces. And some people still live in them because they have no better place to go because this is all they have. Uh, and so these spaces, people pass by, I want to invade, I want to move in. I want to, I want to feel that struggle that how do you, how do you move through this mentally? How do you maintain your health in such a, such a place? How do you, how do you survive? Uh, and, and how do I connect you to the, to the other end of the spectrum where they live comfortable, they live well? How do I get people to see that we all share this world in a different way, but we can make it better? How do I do that as a painter? Uh, and not uh, be sentimental about it, but to be honest and 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 uh, you know in your face. Yeah, and I think that's I just to that. make to make a little uh, connection with Clark Healings. I think he he has the same perspective of 
not romanticizing something, but painting, a, you know, a scene that is showing, you know, workers working somewhere. I mean, it's often talked about, and Elizabeth will talk about, and if she wants to chime in, you, welcome to Elizabeth, please do. But about sort of like, this is what's happening in the 20th century. This is what people are doing here. You know, they're, this is where they're sitting. This is what it looks like. And, you know, just as sort of like a little snapshot of, without being a, an explicit statement about anything, like you say, it's not really political. It's just, this is human struggle this right. is where we're at this is what's going on and i think that's a that's a strong connection that uh the two of you have in terms of you know point of view or subject matter and your approach to to painting different people and i think most painters who um, are interested in and in that type of uh, subject matter they're usually they are usually risk takers uh they're risk takers uh and I know, you know, for me, I, I painted uh, friends who've had Alzheimer's, who've had cancer. I painted a lot of family members. Uh, and so I've had people say that you're never going to sell this or never going to sell that. And, and I said, yeah, that, that's, you may be right. I may not. Uh, but, you know, that's not the main objective for me. Uh, I want to sell my work, but that is not the main objective. And so... Uh, I want collectors, I, I want to take the collector on a journey. I don't want the collector taking me on the journey. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I want to inform you about the world the way I see it. And hopefully I can, uh, I can enlighten you about something that you may have passed by on a daily basis and never even thought one moment about the space and what happens in the space. And so I've communicated something you know, to you that is, that is made you see the world different, uh, made you look at something deeper, uh, not just something that you can put on your wall and, and like it, uh, but something that can enlighten you about uh, the larger world, uh, about us as a human race. Uh, and, 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 and in some way to try to dismantle some of the social constructs that has crippled our creativity and crippled our humanity and strangled us with all these political ideologies. We're all, we're only here for a brief amount of time. And how do I use it to the fullest of my advantage beyond just my own greed in terms of material wealth? How can I, how can I enlighten you with my brush and bring you, bring you closer in um, to, I don't know, I no other way to say this. <laughs> I hope I'm making sense to people. Uh, oh, yeah, I mean, you're making sense to me. Elizabeth, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to tell you, but me up. I was just going to say um, it's about creating a scenario that enables somebody to feel empathy, to yes. put themselves in that other person's shoes or imagine it. it to imagine themselves in that scenario. And then, yeah, maybe they feel really uncomfortable there. And I like that. Yeah, you succeeded then, right? right? Yes, and I like that. The other thing you just said that, you know, um, it, is it taking a risk? Well, no, the risk is not doing it. And then yeah. reaching the end of your life and realizing that you didn't do what you needed to do. You didn't do what you came to the planet to accomplish. So following the muse is not the risk. But my question would be, at what point do you say, okay, I'm, I'm doing these things, but I'm also needing to live my life and pay my own bills. And so the market versus the muse, you know? Ah. And how do you make those decisions? I mean, I hear you say you're, yeah. you know, you're, you're spoon feeding the, the Ruidoso art collectors to, to acclimate them because there's, it, it's both, right? Yes, I mean, uh, let's, let, let, me, let me give you an, a little bit of an example here. I was in a gallery, one of my first galleries in Kansas City uh, called the American Legacy. And, uh, you know, whenever you deal with a dealer, of course, they gotta be concerned with selling. And, and you yourself as a creative force have to be concerned with selling because you're gonna make a living. And so, uh, the first show I did okay. Well, I, I don't know if it's okay. I really didn't do that well, actually. Uh, after about after about eight months' work, I made about seven hundred dollars. Oh God, this ain't gonna work. And so, uh, and 
and then I raised prices slightly. And of course, you're unknown. And so people are not willing to pay the money. And then I was the first person of color that the, the gallery ever represented. So race kept coming up. So I said, oh, my God, this is, just, this is definitely not going to work. So I said, OK, I, I've heard so much about race. How can I take race out of the equation? Uh, and so the way I decided was, ah, art competitions. So I decided to enter art competitions. This is how I made a living for a number of years. I made a living. I would make between thirty and forty thousand dollars a year competing for prize money. This is how much money I would make competing. Uh, and I bought a book, uh, How to Invest a Thousand to Five Thousand Dollars. I learned about Vanguard, uh, Fidelity, uh, American Century, all these different investment firms and stuff. I started. I got a. I got a subscription to Money Magazine. So I took out an IRA. And I thought, oh my God, I'm always going to be poor. I'm always going to be broke. I'm not going to have anything. You know? And so I stopped saying it to myself and I would invest in a, in a, four, I mean, a, an IRA and I was investing money. And so I wanted freedom. And I realized the only way I was going to have freedom was I needed to make money. So I live way below my means and, and I invested as much as I possibly could. And, but the art competitions was my road to freedom. I could not sell the work, but I figured out a way in which to generate income on a really substantial way through entering competitions. People wonder why there's over 600 awards. They're probably like over a thousand by now. But so I've entered these shows and I invested. You know what? And then because of all these shows I entered, I got calls from galleries. I got a lot of magazine articles. This led to gallery representation. The gallery representation, I started realizing the difference between being represented in some place like Kansas City as opposed to a place like New Orleans. New Orleans established me financially as an American painter. I, I cannot, I'll, I'll just have to say it. Bryant Galleries in New Orleans. Um, and I learned the power of the press. I learned the power of the critic through submitting my uh, competitions to newspapers and they would print them in the news in the Sunday edition. So I also recognized the power of the critic. And so I stay true to myself as a painter and slowly my work started getting attention. I got a, I got an article in the Christian Science Monitor when I was in um, the, um, there, there was a real show in Denver held by the Rotary Club. I was in a show there this person came in, I did not sell my work hardly, but she wrote for the Christian Science Monitor. That article crossed the desk of K-State president. They were building a museum. I got to have a solo show at that particular museum who introduced me to Crosby Kemper, who's one of America's top 100 collectors. And so that also led to me getting a representation at Bryant Galleries. And Bryant Galleries, after I self-published my first book, which was told was, was a vanity thing to do, well, if no one's willing to invest in me because I'm a person of color and they decided that they can't sell it, you know, I did it myself and my sales tripled in New Orleans. So I could not keep paintings on the wall hardly in New Orleans. In fact, I was selling so much, I, I, I actually was scared. I was painting profusely and I was making so much, it frightened the crap out of me. But what I didn't do was I didn't waste my money. I invested it. And so I'm, I'm financially stable. So if someone wants to buy my work, great, great. If it speaks to you and it, and it, and it resonates with you, great. But I have total freedom because I stayed with my dream when I painted what I believed in and the, and the collectors came. The one who, the internet, you know, the international market I was in just, it opened up a, a, a world to me of collectors from all over the world who was buying my work because it spoke to them on a very visceral human way. And the gallery, I remember the gallery owner, he was really sweet. He, you know, I was starting to do these urban scenes and he was like, oh God, these, these black kids on the urban. He just thought, we're never gonna sell these black people on the urban core. Now, what are you doing? Send me some more shrimp boats or something, which I love doing. But I said, I'm not doing shrimp boats now, Mr. Allen. This is where I'm at. This is the place I'm living. I'm in the urban core. I'm, I'm absorbing this environment and this is the environment I wanna paint. And guess what? I sent the paintings anyway to New Orleans. He sold both of them, calling me up, wanting to know if I had any more. And so dealers are often led by what sells. 
I'm led by the emotional content of the work. And if you have a good dealer, they can communicate that to the viewer, then, then, you, then you have a real collector. You know, so it, it, it's hard to explain this, but I have total freedom to paint what I want to paint and I love it. Uh, and I took risks. Uh, did I sell well right away? No, a lot of the work stacked up in my studio couldn't even hardly give it away, especially ones of African-Americans, you know, so, but in New Orleans, the internet, it was an international market and the flavor of the work, it just spoke to the collectors and that established me as a, as a painter financially. I uh, now, they've since closed. I've been rebuilding with another gallery in St. Augustine at Cutter and Cutter. They're doing a great job. I, you know, I have other galleries out West that kind of struggles with me, but, but again, you know, uh, because I did certain things, I have the freedom to explore. I had the freedom to, if I want to go more abstract, the more I can push the way I want to go without someone, without constantly thinking about the audience. I don't want to think about the audience. I want to think about the moment and, and why I'm painting the damn thing. Uh, and hopefully I can pull, I can, like I said, I can hopefully move that collector with me. Again, not having the, you know, not doing what the, I think the collector might like. Uh, can I do something that probes that co collector to say, mm, that's different. I like to have that in my collection. Uh, you know, it, you know, when I met Mr. Kemper, it was very interesting. He, he had me look at his collection and it was very eclectic. And I was asking him about this and, you know, he was, he was just explaining how he collected art. I don't follow trends. You know, he, you know, he's, he's educated, but he doesn't follow trends. He doesn't follow subject. It has to, it has to have something in it for him. You know, I, I don't know if this makes sense, but it, that's the same way for me as a painter. I remember he was, he came over to my studio. I was so embarrassed. I was working out of my basement. I was really embarrassed. He was a guy with all, you know, his money coming to buy work for me. And I felt so embarrassed. I said, you know, so embarrassed. I'm still working in my basement. And he said, I don't care if it comes out of a closet. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> love it. <laughs> I wish I, I'm um, regretful that this didn't come up earlier um, and that we don't have more time because I think we need to switch to some questions. But you, what you were just talking about, I can't help but go back to the piece about the power of critics and media because in my mind, when you were talking about that, I thought about the New York Times piece in Black, the Black Romantic show. Yeah which I think is fascinating and you talking about your book and how you sold nothing and then you sold all your books and then there was backlash about that and it maybe didn't you know, help your career in certain paths or directions. Um, <laughs> now I'm setting it up and we can't even go there unless you wanna do a quick comment, but I think- Well, let me do a quick comment about that. Uh, actually, when I was in Black Romantic, uh, it was really funny. It's, I wanna talk briefly about the book because I think it's, it's very poignant about the power of critics. When Michael Kimlin did this review, uh, I had no idea that that my work would be from the very top of the New York Times to the very bottom. It was one of the largest reproductions in the history of New York Times as of my work. The only way I, I know that is because the Library of Congress called me and told me I had made history. So they had to do something for the Library of, Con of Congress on me. And so, but what was really fascinating, I had my book up there. No one bought a single book at the opening. They just, you know, wasn't interested in it. But the, the minute that article hit out, the books flew off the shelves. It could, there was, the books were gone. Uh, but again, uh, it did do some good because uh, Brian Galleries used that provenance. Uh, and I've told people over and over, you know what? <laughs> if I don't paint another picture, the New York Times has sealed my fate. They will dig me up from the grave because of that article. Believe me, uh, and in regards to the black figure and calling me a virtual modern day Vermeer high dignified people of color. I mean, I've been painting people of color for a long time and taking and putting them in different environment in different spaces. Some of those spaces are more abstract. Some of them are rules. Some of them are very contemporary and very modern. And so, uh, you know, the bottom line of it is, is that, uh, you know, I think an artist, you know, has Again, you know, I took a lot of risks, uh, and I had a, I had I had the body of work. Had I had I abandoned black the black figure because uh, I thought it wouldn't sell, and all I did was landscape, which I'm very capable of doing. I'm very capable of doing whatever I want as a painter. So the bottom line of it is, had I abandoned that figure, I would have never been in that show. I would have never been in that show. I would have never received that type of uh, acclaim. And so, and the fact that 
you know, that uh, that he th thought enough of my work. And even the thing about it is that he did talk about the abstract quality of the work, which I which I love too. So, you know, uh, but again, you know, uh, some, you know, at the politics of it, some have buried that article, but you can't bury it forever. <laughs> so, Very true. <laughs> you know, right. it's funny because the the thing that got me in front of the the president of the United States was a, was a small watercolor of my friend Bob Ragland. You know, they weren't familiar with me. The National Portrait Gallery wasn't familiar with me. I was in the um, uh, the Outwin Portrait Show. They had over twenty five hundred entries. They only selected forty three artists. I was one of the forty three artists. They were not familiar with me. They wanted to see a body of my work. I sent them an eclectic body of work that, that showed the, the African-American figure in different uh, uh, abstract forms and, and, and different things. And so the, apparently uh, they called me up and wanted to put me in a slide bank, which I was not interested in because I wasn't interested in doing portraiture work. And uh, the next thing I know, I'm getting another call with the, the curator and the director of the museum wanting to, to nominate me for this portrait and was I even interested and uh and so because I don't like commission work because you know people want to control what they want to see and uh and and I had a very good conversation with them and uh their, their curator Thelma Goldens was there she was the one who put on the black romantic show and I made it very very clear to them that if I were to do the portrait I wanted complete control because that's, that's how I am as a painter. I need complete control. I did want him to sit, I said I could use photographs as well, but you know, I needed him to sit, I needed to draw him, I need to sketch him, I need to hear his experiences uh, as, as, as President of the United States because this would play a role in how I paint him. Uh, now, whether that you know, uh, caused any problems with, with him selecting me or not, I have no idea. But uh, it, it, was, it was great to even be considered considering the fact that the National Portrait Gallery was not familiar with me, and he was on and on about the abstract call at work, how I placed a figure in the space. The director was very poignant about that. Uh, and so that was very gratifying for me as a painter. They thought enough of my work, not even knowing me, to put me in front of President. I said, oh, that, yeah. yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I was pretty flattered, and, and at the same time, uh, you know, uh, a little, I don't want to say, uh, a little intimidated to some degree because uh, I knew if I did it, I was going to, it was going to, I would have to, you know, I would have to go in, I would have to shut people out. Um, and because, and because when I'm doing something like that, I, you know, I tend to close in and shut people out and it's, you know, um, not always good. I have a family now, so I struggle with some of had I had I gotten it, I did struggle with some of that. That I knew that I would have to really go in to to really do this thing the way I wanted to do for it to have the emotional power that I wanted this thing to have. Yeah, it would be personally taxing. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Indeed. Okay, I think Penelope, are we going to do some questions? Yeah, I'd love to go to questions. And if I may, I'd like to start with Steve Zimmerman's question that was in the chat. Unless Steve, unless Steve, you would like to just ask it. Maybe, but I'm ready to narrate. Okay. Um, Steve would like to know, can you comment on your figurative work? It rarely display, displays human interaction. Is that a product perhaps of your isolation as a painter? Yeah, I, I think it is. Uh, now I know for a fact that um, that isolation uh, is just, is something that I'm, I'm naturally drawn to. I don't know exactly why. Now I have had, uh, I have done on occasions uh, paintings where there are family members who are, are involved interlockingly, but, but uh, it's always been a sort of uh, a quiet, reserved uh, type of, of work, a more pro it's, that's to me more probing. I, I don't know, I, you know, I think I experienced uh, probably death at a very early age with my grandma Celia. It's, it's always been, you know, um, sort of interesting to me, uh, kind of inward thing, I suppose, and maybe even being rejected by my father and feeling isolated in some way. And my mother was not around. It was my grandmother who raised me. She was 
much each was an elder, elderly and people have commented about me paying a lot of elderly people. Uh, so I'm sure that that has a lot to do even with my mother, uh, I think carrying me that she, she ran, she was afraid, she, she felt isolated. Uh, I think a lot of that uh, has just, it's just part of who I am as a, as a human being. Uh, I think that when someone's carrying you and they're uncertain and they're afraid and, and feel this, I think I just, I have inherited that. Sometimes I wonder, sometimes I look at someone and go, ah, why am I so interested in these spaces? And it's just who I am. I don't know how else to explain it. Um, you know, I'm I'm very interested in in people when they are grappling with their own mortality. I'm very interested in that 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 moment of life sort of coming to a close. But is it? You know, it's it's sort of a, a you know. I remember I did a painting of my grandmother. Uh, it's called at peace, and uh, when she, the way she was looking at me, as I'm drawing her, it was as if as if she was trying to take all of me in. I mean, she was looking at me from my head to my toes, as if she was at the latter part of her life, as if she wanted to take me back into eternity. With I could feel her all over me. Uh, I like that intimacy and in works. That makes any sense. Thank you. I've got a couple more coming to me in chat. Uh, Cynthia would like to know which visual artists influenced you as you were developing your style. Oh man, God, there's so many. I'll be honest with you. <clears throat> I know I've, I've been compared to Hopper Wyatt. I mean, it's it's been it's been all over the place, and I kind of like that actually. Um, but uh, I'll tell you, <clears throat> I wasn't even really that familiar with, with Andy White until I got in college. Somebody had said something to me because I painted a lot of bars and, you know, it's said something about life. And I said, like, yeah, you know. <laughs> so I went to the library and got this book and I was just like floored because I'll tell you why I was floored. It wasn't so much the barns. It was the fact that he was painting Black people. I'd never seen so many Black people in an art book. I was like, wow. And I thought, this is a white guy. He's painting black people. You know, this is really interesting. And then I thought, I started thinking about Henry Tanner and all, you know, and how he couldn't get the black figure accepted. And he was this Caucasian gentleman who, you know, and so I had all these mixed emotions, but I could not uh, deny the skill set and, and, and the emotion in which he was doing this. And I was very, very fascinated with his use of flesh tones. The people of color. So I was very, because I didn't see anything in the museums. So, so naturally, because I see something that reflects who I am somewhat, I'm like enamored with it naturally. And so, uh, so there's been that comparison, but there's also Rembrandt and, and different artists uh, that, that they got. That's just my work. If you really study it, it's just all over the place. Actually, it really is all over the place in terms of of style, it, 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 it shifts, it, it shifts, it, it's a subtle shift, but it, it, it shifts all over the place. And, I, and, I, and I'm sure that's because I'm, I'm taking in information and I'm looking at a lot of different work. My eyes are burning a little bit probably from working, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's just influenced by, you know, I like Franz Klein, Robert Motherwell. I like a lot of not objective painters and you can see that in my work. You can really see it in my work. Uh, I like de Kooning's work. Uh, I, I just, I like a lot of, you know, I'm influenced by Thomas Aikens uh, because, I mean, the Gross Clinton really said, you know, I really love that painting. I mean, the Gross Clinton is just a masterful work and he did it when he was 31. My God, it's just unbelievable. And to think that painting was rejected by the National Academy just blows my mind. I think it's just unbelievable. So uh, I'm just influenced by a lot of painters who, who took risks. You know, I, I like painters who took risks. I, I, I like Lucian Freud's work. Uh, I really love his work a lot. Uh, I mean, I like work that is that has a that has a mystery and a disturbing quality about it. <laughs> that makes sense. Uh, I, I like something that that kind of crawls under your skin. I don't know. I, I just that's what I like. 
It's funny, Dean, because I the, you sent me a bunch of images in preparation for this, and they did sort of run the gamut of different styles. Well, some mm -hmm. of them did more than others, but there was one that I sort of was stuck on because I was thinking it reminded me of a Motherwell painting. Ah. And it's sort of like I stopped in my tracks, like, what? This didn't feel like totally. <laughs> I was, it just caught my attention, but it was your painting that was the doors, which I think is funny because I was looking at it as a much, I was looking at it almost as like an aerial much more abstract or doorways or doors. I'm sorry if I'm not getting it right, but, and then, you know, the title gives it a totally different meaning and perspective of a way of looking at it. But there was something about that, that my immediate looking at that painting, I thought about Motherwell. I know the one you're talking about. Um, I've, I've done a lot of, uh, I, when I was with, uh, speaking of experimentation, when I was with Brian Galleries, I did a lot of interesting still lifes that had this kind of, you know, abstract quality to them, where you're kind of losing and finding a space and a form and an atmosphere, and you know, using some type of representational object within the space to uh, to it's 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 realism and abstraction kind of combined, uh, yeah. you know. So there's, you know, I, I looked at a lot of, uh, you know, it's a little Matisse coming through in this as well. And, and yep. Devin Corn. there's like, a, you know, I, I looked at a lot of Devin Corn's work and, and uh, you, you know, you can see Matisse all up in that, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you can see, you can see Devin Corn all up in Matisse and you can see even Romare Beard in, uh, in, and Jacob Lawrence as well. You know, you can see the cubism and all this stuff. And there's, uh, there's some interesting still lifes that Matisse did with nothing but grays and, and muted tones and uh, just, just beautiful what someone can do with just a couple of colors and the, the subtle nuances of grays. I really like a lot of subtle nuances of grays and stuff and what a painter can do with that is, is yeah. Yeah, you're also bringing up, I, I really, I it, it, in another space would love to talk to you about Romare Bearden. I think he's a really interesting example during the abstract expressionist movement and that he lost his gallery for a bit because he wasn't abstract enough and he was trying yes. to you know his his paintings about where he lived and then the collages i just think he's in really interesting well, it's, it, and you know a, a lot of times you know what 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 an artist has to realize too is that the landscape is always changing uh in terms of what's acceptable what's edgy what's cutting edge what isn't cutting edge and so you know uh you can't concern yourself with that as a painter uh, you know, how many times have we seen painters totally discarded uh, by critics and then and then hailed as brilliant down the road, uh, yeah. you know, uh, and this is what, I, you know, this, I, I always like uh, uh, looking at painters who move. Uh, when I look at uh, Devin Korn's work, there's not objective work and he moves into the figure and mm -hmm. he, he marries that abstraction and that figure so beautifully in terms of the way he handles space and 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 de Kooning, the same thing with that you can see a lot of the gestural movements in, in his work uh as well so uh and you know when i look at jacob lawrence work i see a lot of the i, I see a lot of the abstraction and the cubism and, and all this stuff uh you know i and even when we look at uh you think for example about people like Picasso uh, during the time in which the camera became, you know, really into its, its maturity where artists now were not wanting to compete with the camera, but then began to move away and, and, and abstract and start pulling from different cultures to enhance that abstraction, like African sculptures, they used uh, collages, uh, they lose, they use textiles and start gluing things onto things to pull away and to be more creative and to give uh, the viewer uh, a different textual sen sensation with the work upon viewing it. And so, you know, there's just a lot of things uh, that artists can do uh, to uh, enhance the viewer's experience of a work. Uh, it doesn't always just have to be paint. The one you saw, The Doors, is actually, it, it, it was, it's a small painting that I set on top of the surface. If you saw it, it sits on top slightly but I, but I did all these abstract forms around it. And I, and I basically, it was a very realistic door and I basically painted it out. If they x-ray it, you'll see that it's very realistic. And I began to chop away, trying to marry the two, two abstract, trying to show people that everything's basically abstraction. You know, even yeah. realism, it, it's all an abstraction. 
it's all of it. That's cool. Doesn't matter what it is. Everything's abstract to me, even realism. You know, it's, just, it's an abstraction to me. I have another question uh, from the crowd. This is from Mitchell. Uh, he would like to know, does Dean try to get into the thoughts of a sitter or is he conscious of putting some of his own ideas into the painting? Mm. I think that that, that kind of goes both ways. Uh, sometimes there's actual conversations. Sometimes there are no conversations. Uh, and I think that I, I know that some of it is probably my own personality because I, you know, sometimes when I'm drawing someone, it, it, it shifts because it, as you're drawing someone, their, their, their body changes right before your eyes, their, their gesture, their, you know, it all changes. Uh, so, and sometimes you, you know, when you're, when, if you work from drawings or sketches, that experience is, is, a, is a part of it. Now, is, is some of that me in there? It probably is because I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm drawn to certain people for, for a reason. Uh, the stuff, I mean, I, I kind of wonder, there is a lot of, you know, I do a lot of elderly people and I go, wow, you know, I do do, somebody mentioned something about me doing a lot of elderly people and they said something about, uh, talk about a controversial comment that, you know, I, I did what was comfortable for white folks. I did a lot of elderly people, some, some kind of craziness. You know, it's, all, it's so crazy, but you know, but I, okay, I, I could see that, you know, I'm, I, I'm not, I'll have an angry black man in the painting or, or whatever, and this kind of stuff, you know? So, I mean, I get it, I get it, you know, the, the, you know, but it, it, it's, it's just really interesting uh, how people can view something and thinking that you're pandering to the audience, what I don't know, even thinking about the audience at all. So people bring their own baggage to something, uh, but that's not my that's not my problem. You know, uh, my problem is uh, hopefully try to capture something uh, that that has some real serious depth to it. Uh, that's, that's my only my only struggle <laughs> really when I'm painting. I've got a couple more that just came in. We'll probably have to wrap up in a moment. So if I have any last questions after these two, just throw them into the chat. Um, Mitchell would also like to know what your in original introduction to Clark Hewlings was, Dean. When did you first hear about Clark Hewlings? Actually, you know, I heard about Clark Hewlings when I was in, uh, when I, well, actually when I uh, was at Hallmark Cards. Uh, you know, they had these magazines, you know, uh, and I remember there was this one scene, I can't think of the name of this painting, but it, it had some, some cars in it. It was very subtle, it was very muted tones, but the light and the texture and the atmosphere, it was just an extraordinary work. Who is this, Clark Hume, wow. You know, that was probably my, probably it might've been Southwest Art, I don't know, it was one of, the, one of those magazines. Uh, and then I started hearing more about Preta West. So actually, I heard about him in the 80s. That's when I first heard about Clark Hewlett was in the 80s. That's great. Thank you. And then Ellen would like to know, did you spend time with Bob Ragland in Denver? Uh, he's an old Denver character. And if you knew him, you were very lucky. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 I spent a lot of time with Bob, actually. You know, I, I can talk very freely here about Bob. Bob, you know what? He's, you know, I miss him. He's gone now, but I miss him. I, I remember uh, I got invited to uh, Artists of America in Denver. I had just been in this show down in Rio Doso called the Hubbard Art Award for Excellence. And Bob called me out of the blue, didn't know him from a hill of beans. He said, I'm Bob Ragland, you don't know me. I, I, I don't want anything from you. He said, but I see you in a lineup. And I kind of laughed and I said, what kind of lineup are you talking about? You can't be called a black man talking about you in a lineup, you know? So and he, she started laughing and we just kind of hit it off. He said, well, would you come to Denver? I'd like to meet you. And uh, I met him and uh, he was very poignant. I learned a lot from Bob about the struggle of African-American artists. And because uh, I was so busy in the trenches just doing my thing and trying to figure out how to keep myself going. But he, he, he exposed me to a lot of things about the struggle of African-American artists. This guy had an archive that you wouldn't believe on artists. Uh, Henry Tanner, Jacob Lars, I mean, you know, I can go down a list. I can't even, you know, he would send me all this material and it was, it was, some of it was just heart-wrenching. Uh, and so uh, I remember being in the show at, at the Arts of America, he, you know, my mom, I invited my mom and one of my cousins said, we got back to the hotel and my mom said, Bob said, you're not gonna sell none of your work. 
I said, really? He said, yeah. I said, what? what? He said, because you want too much for it. They're not going to pay him. You know, he want what they want. They ain't going to pay him. And I said, wow, really? Oh, that's really interesting. I was like, well, I don't, I don't get into him what he charged for his work. And I did find a struggle trying to find a market for what I was doing. Uh, but uh, again, you know, in fact, I would go to these shows and hardly sell anything. And my auntie said, well, why does he keep going? He can't nobody hardly buy him nothing from him. Why does he keep going to these shows? And I said, auntie, I'm in the room. I am the only one in the room, if you get what I'm saying. So, um, so I didn't let that bother me not selling anything because I was selling elsewhere. So, um, so that was never <laughs> a real issue. The real issue was I had to do what I wanted to do. And so, but as things went along, it all worked out. Collectors start buying here or there. And I'm not popular in, in some of these shows and I recognize that. Uh, I'm not after being popular. Uh, I'm after, you know, I'm after, I'm after your soul if you want to, if you're really interested in what I do, you know, uh, and so, uh, and if you're okay with, with sometimes buying something that is disturbing and that moves you in a way, then I'm for you. Uh, but, uh, so it's, it, you know, it's all worked out for me. I have a great time. I love a lot of the artists that I'm in shows with. Uh, I enjoy the fact that they extended the invitation to me. I'm very grateful for that. And also, you know, just, just trying to, to do the best that I can do, but stay true to who I am as a human being and as a painter, because the day I lay my head cold, you know, I don't want to say I just sold a bunch of stuff I didn't really want to do to people. I want to say I gave it my best shot. I gave it my honest shot. Uh, and they certainly got a piece of me. They didn't get something they just wanted to just stick on their wall. They got a piece of my soul. That's what I'm about is painting. I'm not going to change. It's not going to happen. I am what I am. Well, I think that's that's a perfect note to go out on. Um, thank you so much for being here, Dean. It was such a pleasure and an honor to talk to you. So thanks. My pleasure. My pleasure as well. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Thank Appreciate you oh, so much. That was fascinating. Alan, can we do it again? Yeah, I feel like you guys could have another yeah. hour and a half oh, conversation. Well, we wouldn't have hey, to be around and it would be just as fascinating and interesting. Hey, art is my favorite subject and, and people <laughs> too. So, you know, and, and, and you know, again, art can move us forward. It can move us forward and 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 make us better as human beings. And uh, that's what it's about. That's what it's about. Well, that's why we're here. That's why the Clark Killings Foundation exists. That's why I'm doing everything I'm doing because Without it, we're in trouble. Oh, we're in big trouble. <laughs> so, yeah, we got to move forward, not off a cliff. Absolutely. And it's the, it's the creatives, it's the inventors, it's the people with the ideas who are going to help us do that. So, thank you both. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And um, we'll pick it up next time. Our next one, we will, we're going to lay out August because everybody's exhausted and on walkabout. So we're going to pick it back up in September and um, we'll, we'll take it from there. Thank you to Shirley Holland and to Penelope for steering us through this and to Alex and Dean. Uh, until next time.